Good morning to you, family. We had a couple of glitches this morning at the live transmission um, of the service that I did, the second part of redirecting discouragement. We had some technical <laughs> problems and glitches and challenges, so the message was not recorded. But because this message is so important, we decided that I'm going to record it here on Zoom so that you have it. You can listen to listen to the second part of redirecting discouragement. This was the, this was the message that I preached last Sunday, the first part of it, and this is the second part of it. Because so many people in this world right now, let's just talk about for a moment about South Africa. In South Africa, people are extremely discouraged because of our national situation with load shedding. And now with all the rains we've had here, we've got a lot of flooding. A lot of places is underwater. And we this morning just want to focus and concentrate on the fact that where we are at right now, God is fully aware of our situation. God is not wondering what to do about our situation. God already, he is way ahead of the enemy. And you've heard me preach this on numerous occasions, how God is ahead of the enemy. He's not lagging behind. He's not thinking, oh my word, what am I going to do about what the devil is doing in the nations of the world? No, not at all. God is ahead of things, guys. So, so this morning, what I want to do is catch up from where we spoke last week when we spoke about the fact that, and I mentioned a couple of individuals, I mentioned uh, Elijah, I mentioned Peter, I mentioned the fact that Job was not in a good place when everything that he had was taken from him. And, you know, we need to realize as well in this world that we are in right now, if there is something, I just want to say this, if there is something that God would take away from your life now, something that you deem very important, what would you do? Would you miss that particular thing that's taken away? Would you actually miss it so much that you would go into a state of disillusionment, discouragement, maybe even depression? Then it means that you have applied identity to that thing and it actually became an idol in your life. That's the reality. So what we need to do as God's people is always have our focus on God. That's why you'll see that picture that's in the background that I'm keeping up there for, for the series that I did on <clears throat> redirecting discouragement is where are you at this morning? Is God your priority? Are you constantly seeking the face of the Lord? So what we said last week, I'm going to recap very, very quickly. We said that Job was in a horrible place. We would all agree with that. And we said that his wife even said, well, curse God and I, his friends were there, but his friends didn't really give good advice. And we spoke about that last week. Then we spoke about the fact that Elijah taking out 840 prophets of Baal. Then Elijah gets threatened by Jezebel. He runs into the desert, sits under a tree, and he feels sorry for himself. And God has to feed him where he is because he's so disillusioned, disconnected from the reality of what God had called him to do, and he's in a place of, of depression. That's what happened to Elijah. Then we spoke about the disciples, how upset the disciples were when Jesus just made a general statement, because it says he was walking around in Galilee with his disciples, not specifically going for a specific mission or a task or a, a ministry in somebody's home somewhere. They were just walking around, and Jesus made the statement they, that he was going to be killed, but he would be raised on the third day. Remember that? And the disciples were distraught. In fact, the, the Greek language there, when you go study that scripture, they were extremely upset and disillusioned and discouraged because Jesus said he was going to be killed. They obviously believed him. That's why they became so discouraged. But they didn't hear the last bit of what Jesus said in that he would rise up again from the dead. And he would be back with them again, obviously for a couple of days before he would be resurrected to be at the right hand of his father again. We spoke about Peter, who was in a place of disillusionment and discouragement. And the proof of that is there was only one disciple that was at the crucifixion of Jesus, and that was John. Peter, James, and John, they, those were the, the guys who were the inner circle. Inner circle. They, they formed the inner circle of Christ. And only John was at the crucifixion. The rest of the disciples were not there. You remember that Peter denied him. 
three times before the cock crowed. You remember that? So here is the reality that we get discouraged by life. We get discouraged by things. We get these influences coming from the outside in. The enemy would want to keep you in a place of discouragement and disillusionment. That's his ultimate goal. He wants to do that in your life. He wants you to be in that place where you are getting up in the morning, but you don't feel like anything. Anyone ever been there? You feel like you just want to stay in bed, cover your face with a pillow. You've been there. <laughs> how, many, how many people feel absolutely disillusioned with life? Because all you are hearing is bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. And I want to now give you the answers. We spoke about four different groups. Um, we, well, we spoke about Elijah, we spoke about Job, and then we spoke about the disciples, we spoke about Peter, four different scenarios. And now this morning, I want to encourage you through four answers that I want to give you on how to get out of that place of disillusionment. Now, many of you know already the courses that I've also written and put together over a period of just about 30 years. These courses that I've put together, it's there for the body of Christ to become equipped and trained and educated in the things of the word of God concerning mind dynamics of from the Bible, learning the things about psychology from God's word. Now, I have been laughed at, guys. You need to know, I have been ridiculed by people saying to me, there's no such thing as biblical psychology. There's no such thing as that because psychology is a bad thing. And I know I agree. There are so many things with psychology that's so bad because Freud and Skinner and all those ghost, ghosts, <laughs> all those guys who wrote about psychology wrote it from a premise of introspection. A lot of the things that Freud wrote, he wrote it from introspection. So that is why everything has got to be verified and tested. There are some good things in psychology. Now, psychology, suhi means the mind. Ology is study of, the study of the mind. Now, the Bible gives us the best psychology because Jesus Christ is the greatest psychologist that ever walked the face of the earth. You've heard me say that, and I will repeat it until Jesus comes. So I will keep on saying that because it's the truth. So here's the thing. These things that I'm going to share with you now is such that I want you to grab a hold of this and realize that you can get out of that place of disillusionment and discouragement and even depression. Absolutely. I know there are biological reason, reasons for, um, for depression that can happen uh, because of poor diet, poor nutrition. You can get depressed. Absolutely. Because of the brain that's not being fed. But that's a different subject for another time. But the first thing that I want to say to you, in order to redirect discouragement when it comes to you, and this is a term that I heard from the Spirit of God over the past couple of weeks. Guys, I want to share this with you because this is from my personal life. About two or three weeks ago that I've been on this, it's been longer than 10 days, definitely about two weeks plus. I heard the Spirit of God say this to me the one morning when I was in prayer. I heard the voice of God by the Spirit saying this to me. I want you to push into me. Now think about that statement. I want you to push into me. You need to get to that place where it's that, that intricate intimacy again with me. Where you learn from me. Because he constantly encourages us to do that. To come to him. To learn from him. To learn of him. And I started doing that, and I'm still busy with that. I'm still in that process. I don't know how many of you have ever heard that term, but that wasn't something I was familiar with. And then he brought up Psalm 91, verse 1, which we all know so well, and we can quote it. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's what we're talking about. And that's why the Bible speaks to us so many times in so many different places. In the book of Psalms, it's mentioned a number of times. In the New Testament, it is saying, put on the new man. And in the Old Testament, it's talking about pushing into God or then seeking him with everything we have on the inside of him. Seeking his face. It's always so important to seek the face of God 
and not his hand what he can do for you because when you seek the face and you are with him in his person and you're relating to him from a son and a daughter point of view it's amazing how many things that he supplies in your life because then you see his hand once you seek his face that is so important to get our priorities right when it comes to that so i'm asking you are are you pushing into god now I know many of you have seen the Asbury revival that's busy happening uh, near Kentucky in the U.S. Now, I had never heard of Asbury. I didn't even know there was such a place. And at the university campus, a whole lot of students were having a service. And I'm not going to go into the whole thing of how it started. But the fact is revival started there and it's still going. And Thousands upon thousands of young people's lives have been touched and changed and transformed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are those who question and say, well, is it a real revival? Is it this? Is it that? We need to be very careful with that. You know, we can so analyze something that we, we lose the power of it. Now, listen to this. Somebody wrote this, and I thought this was very, very precious. This person wrote, the main takeaway from the Asbury revival is this. There is a piano player, a guitar player, and a single drum, and hard chairs. There's not very, a, a very attractive interior. The lights don't dim. No one is serving donuts. Not a single smoke machine. No fancy lights. No timers. No perfect productions. No leader and no teams. No hierarchy or competition. No kids class. Nobody greets you in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Literally no structure whatsoever. Apparently the only thing needed to attract people to God is God. Why have we made things so complicated? Time to get back to the pure and the simple and all an altar and a sacrifice. That's it. To, to present ourselves as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And this is what the New Testament teaches us, guys. Let's have him back in his own house. Just worship him and see what happens. Praise him. He inhabits the praises of his people. By the way, these things that we are saying and what this person is mentioning here about lights and smoke machines and uh, very, very fancy interiors and all those things, nothing wrong with that. But all I'm saying is I love it that it's the place that I didn't even know about. A lot of people, when you talk about Asbury, they go, where's that? Just like me. <laughs> you know what I love about it? As God chooses a place where a whole lot of hungry students, not after hype, but hungry, not after hype, but hungry for a move of God. And now revival breaks out there. And as by the way, it's hitting all different places of the earth right now. We are going to see this happen in Africa and South Africa. We are going to see it happening. We will see it. So what is the first thing in order to redirect discouragement is become closely acquainted with God personally, push into him. Let God be your all in all, your everything again. Your time, your talent. And we used to say in the old days, your Tom, which means your finances. Are you, are you, in that place where God is your everything. Guys, you know what? We know it so well. We can store up things in this life, but you cannot take it with you. What are you investing in people's lives? Are you investing time, your talents, your gifts that God has given you? That's not for you. Everything that God has given you is for you to let it flow through you. Can I say that again? Everything that God has given you is for it to flow through you. So many of us hold it tight on the inside and it doesn't flow. It's like a stagnant pool. And you know, stagnant pool eventually starts to smell because a pool is supposed to have an inlet and an outlet. The rain comes in and flows out on the other side. It stays fresh. That's where we need to be at. So how do you redirect discouragement? Push into God. Sit in the presence of the Almighty. Dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I taught a sermon once where I spoke about seekers and dwellers. 
seeking the face of the Lord, then once you find what you are looking for in him, because he's your everything, you start dwelling there. Then you don't leave. You remain in the presence of the Almighty. You say, but I have to go to work. I have to do this. I have to do my job. I have to see clients. I have. I understand all of those things, but let him be your big. I am in your day. Speak to him frequently. He's your audience of one minister unto the Lord in praise and worship in your car. Pray, be with him. He so desires to be with you. The Lord is good, the Bible says in Nahum 1 verse 7. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust him. Listen to that. He knows those who trust him. Do you trust God today? Where's that meter at? Where's your trust meter? Where, what's the level from zero to 100? Be honest today while you are listening to this message, wherever you are in the world. And I know this message goes across different continents. Praise God for that. Give all the glory to the Lord that people can hear this. So my question to you and my challenge to you today is, where is your trust meter? Is it on 20%, 40, 60? 80, 85, 90, 90, 100%? How much do you trust God? If it's somewhere here, you need to bring that up. Why? Because he's your all in all. God takes care of you. So push into God, number one. Second thing is, you need to watch your thought life. How are your thoughts today? Where are your thoughts at? What are you thinking about? Do you know, and I've made this statement a number of times, and people have questioned this, and it's so good that they question it, because then I can show them from the scriptures. I want to ask you, do you realize that you are not your thoughts? Think about that. You are not your thoughts. Because if your thoughts have not been transformed yet, from a mind that hasn't accepted the revelation of Christ, and that's your true life reality. If you, if you are still in a place where your mind accepts what you see over above what you believe, you are still in a place where your thoughts will control you. Did you get all of that? So what do you need? You need to be washed in the area and arena of your thoughts. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, we know it so well. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So many scriptures in the New Testament says that we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Do you know that in the Amplified it says every day you need to have a new spiritual um, and mental attitude. You need to have a new spiritual attitude and mental attitude every day. Why? Because of your transformation process. You have heard me say this before, and I'm going to repeat it. Salvation was God's gift to you. Your transformation into the image of Christ is your gift back to God. How far have you been transformed? How's that meter going? You see, if, if you are still here, then the world will control your thoughts, and you'll be operating according to the system of the world. But the moment you start moving across to the new mind in Christ, where you've been transformed and renewed by the renewing of your mind through the word and the Holy Spirit. You're going to start seeing life from God's perspective because of the revelation of Christ in you. You're going to start living that life, which is the new life, which is the transformed life, which is what Jesus spoke about and the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. Go read it. And I said to people this morning in the live service, listen to this very carefully. Now, I've done some studies on this. Guys, this, this can be challenged and questioned. It's fine. You can do that. I'm, I'm just saying to you, after more than 30 years of research in this, 30, 35 years that I've been looking at mind dynamics and how these things work, please understand, I am not even close in having a full understanding of it because I don't believe this side of heaven will have a full understanding of it. But I want to say this. You have about 13 seconds. This is the average time. Of when a negative thought enters your mind, you have about 13 seconds maximum to deal with that thought. Otherwise, that thought becomes an ideation, which means you're going to start thinking about that thought. You're going to start giving it body. You're going to start giving it value. 
then what happens with that ideation, it becomes a feeling. The feeling becomes an actual emotion and that emotion turns into reality, which means you then experience the same thing through that emotion and feeling and reality, what you experienced the time that it happened. And the devil loves to remind you of your past. You know what he does with your mind? This is what he does when you allow him is that he takes the remote control of your mind. Rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play. He can do that all day. And we, of course, talking about his critters. His cohorts will play games in your mind when you give them a landing place. This is very important. I believe that first point I gave you, when you push into God and you make the reality of the Almighty in His presence, your prerogative and your priority, and that's the, the, the platform and base of your operation. The second one, the thought life, is going to start coming into place. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot be in the intimate presence of God and let fear dominate your mind. Come on now. Come on now, guys. Think about that. Think about that. I'm going to say that again. You cannot be in the intimate presence of God and let fear, trepidation, anxiety, worry dominate your mind, not in the presence of God, because it says in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. It doesn't say fullness of fear and trepidation and worry and anxiety. It doesn't say that. Yes, you are, but you don't know my circumstances. Okay. But you are saying, a lot of people have said that. And if you are saying that today, you don't know my circumstances. It means then you are putting what should not be first as first, and you are being dominated by those thoughts. So that has become a greater reality to you. What is happening in the natural dimension than in the spiritual dimension. It says in the book of Corinthians, second Corinthians, I believe it is. It talks about the fact that the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. The things that are seen are the problems. The things that are not seen are the answers. You need to lock into what is not seen because that's where the Holy Spirit shows you your future, where you are at. The book has said it already. The word of God says it. We are the winners at the end of the day. Guys, look at what Jesus has done. Walk in that reality. The third thing is your body. Are you looking after your body? A lot of you know this already, but I am into natural health. I'm talking about the products that God has given us from his earth. I am not into those funny things. I'm not into funny stuff. But God has given us such wealth from the earth. To look after our bodies. Guys, the reality is we are not getting the nutrition that we need from the foods that we get from the shelves. This is a reality. I am not the only one saying that. You've, you've heard many say that. I'm just reiterating that. So that is why I take additional things. Because I believe I need to keep my body healthy because of the revival that is coming. That I can still be used by the hand of God to help bring about the revival that I believe is going to come to our nation and the world. What state is your body in? I know, I know, guys, we don't always want to hear this. But I am not going to preach things that's going to tickle your ears and make you feel good and think, well, that was so awesome. I will listen to all the nice things that he says. I'm a straight talker. I say it as it is because otherwise I'm doing you an injustice. Jesus and his disciples did not ride in between the, 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 the towns on, <laughs> on chariots. <laughs> they did not rent chariots from the Romans. Please just, just humor me for a moment, please. Just don't get cross. Just listen. Jesus and his disciples walked all over the place. That was good exercise. A lot of people have the image of Jesus on the cross as this very scrawny, skinny Jesus. 
I'm sorry. But Jesus working with Joseph in his father's business, where they had to do all of that physical work. I believe Jesus had a strong body and the scripture verifies it. Jesus at one time fell under the cross, the weight of that cross, because he had lost so much blood that Simon of Cyrene came and helped him to pick up that cross again. And he walked with that cross all the way up to Golgotha. And I think about that. And it grabs me always on the inside when I see that. And I think that this man who gave his life for us, where at that point he was so weak because of his loss of blood, he started bleeding already in Gethsemane, where drops of blood came through his skin because of the anguish that he felt of what he knew he was going to go through. And on the way to Golgotha, for that cross to be placed in that hole, he bled all the way from when he was whipped. He's when his body was ripped open for the sins of the whole world. Don't you ever tell me my Jesus was a weak man. He was a strong physical man to be able to deal with that. Back to my point. Are you looking after your body? I believe, please hear this man this morning. I believe that our prayer lines will be much shorter in the churches when our fellow Christians start taking better care of their bodies. Are you exercising? Well, I don't like gyms. It's not what I'm saying. You can do exercises at home. Keep your body supple. Keep your body strong. Keep your body going. You have a responsibility over your body. What does that do as well? When you start exercising, it releases endorphins in your body. It does. It's the feel-good hormones. You start feeling better when you've exercised. Just start by walking, guys. Get a couple of small weights at home and just train at home. But discipline yourself with that. And then lastly, the last point, number four, is... Have your eyes focused in the present and the future. Look at life through two lenses. Here I want to bring in that scripture again. And that scripture that I quoted earlier on is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through to verse 18. You can go read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 18, where we look at the things now that are temporal, but also at the things that are eternal. So when you put on your spectacles of life, the left one is looking at what you are going through now, where you are at. The right one is your eternal perspective. Your present reality and your eternal perspective. Your eternal perspective and who you are in Christ should overflow your present circumstances and reality. What do I mean by that? Is that, and I can't teach this in depth today on the sermon, but you are in a place where there are two kinds of sanctification that takes place in your life. The first one is positional sanctification. It is where Jesus already did it all for you. He paid the price. And the Bible says you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Many people ask, but how can I be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? But I'm still walking on the earth. It's spiritually speaking, as we know, obviously. So you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. That's positional sanctification. He's already made you holy. This is not a heilig makings process. It's not a becoming holy process. You're already seated in heavenly places. Read Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. Then you are now in a place of progressive sanctification. It means that your what I spoke about now, your mind is being transformed by the renewing of the things of God. You're looking after your body as well now. Your spirit, you are pushing into God. So what happens there? It is progressive sanctification. So what do you do in order to discontinue discouragement or then to redirect discouragement? When it comes, is to stop and say, excuse me, not for me, thank you. You can go this way. Is that possible? Yes. You need to put up the filters on your mind. Don't allow the onslaughts of the enemy to come in with all of these negative thoughts, negative concepts, things about your past, accusations against you. You don't have to accept it. Resist him steadfast in the faith is what the Bible says. 
and then get up from there and don't allow those thoughts to 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 wallow in your mind don't allow it to to sit there and just fester when the thought comes stop it block it and say i'm not going to accept that i'm walking in the new life of christ this is my identity this is who i am that's who my father is and this is who i am amen and amen did you get something out of that did that help you today that was the second part now of redirecting discouragement. I pray that you're going to push into God. Watch your thought life. Thirdly is look after your body. And lastly, look at life through two lenses, the present and the eternal. Let the eternal override the present in whom you know you are becoming and not what it is that you have to do all the time to try and prove yourself to anybody or to God or yourself. You don't have to do that. Become what Jesus already paid for. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can I pray for you today? Maybe you are listening to this there where you are now watching me. You are in a place of discouragement. You feel disillusioned. Perhaps you feel indifferent towards the things of God. Then I want to pray for you. And I want to pray that the Lord will touch you where you are listening to this. That your life will be invigorated. That you'll be restored to that place with God. And that you'll feel alive again on the inside of you. I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you in Jesus' wonderful name that I can pray for these precious people online listening to this message right now. And Father, we thank you today that we can have the honor and the privilege and the liberty to push in to the secret place of the Most High. Your word says that we can come unto the throne room of grace boldly. If it means boldly, it means we can come with confidence before our Father. Not in trepidation and fear and anxiety that we're going to receive punishment. Jesus already took it for us. I pray for every person online this morning that's discouraged, disillusioned. That you will at this point in time, right now where you are, pray this over yourself. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. That in your presence, there's fullness of joy. I now decide through my will and through choice, to walk in the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength in Jesus' name. Amen. That was your prayer now for that. Then, Father, I pray that their minds will be renewed according to the word of God and by the spirit of God, that they won't allow thoughts of the enemy to penetrate. Thirdly, Father, we know we must look after our bodies. We must look at what we eat. We must look at how much we eat. We've got to look after ourselves. Holy Spirit, lead God's people on how they need to look after their bodies. And then lastly, Father, I pray for each one that they will look at life through two lenses. What Jesus has done for us already and the life that we need to live right now in the victory of the Christ from the platform of peace through the life of the Prince of Peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It was great to be online with you. I pray that you'll grab a hold of these truths, apply it to your life for permanent life change. You have an awesome day. Take this one, listen to it again. And the first one, I believe it's going to help you and bless you when discouragement wants to find a landing place. God bless. We'll see you tonight for the prophetic service at seven o'clock. Have a good one.